for you to join me today for this first course on ancestral healing. I wanted to jump off today, just right off the deep end, by giving you some examples of ways that ancestry can affect you that you may not recognize. So let's start off with like the lowest hanging fruit, right? Lowest hanging fruit being that we can all accept this because we can see it, right? It's that your ancestors looked a certain way, and so you do, right? The second one being um, your ancestors, let's say that they evolved to produce um, more like energy producing enzymes in the body, right? In the muscles specifically. This means that you can process oxygen more efficiently. And being able to do that makes you much better at endurance, right? So like, let's say that you're a endurance athlete because of this, that's an ancestral inheritance. Um, another example is a person is struggling in a relationship, right? Because they're aloof. Let's say that that's what they're, they're going through. Aloofness being, of course, this like emotional coldness or distance. Now let's find, let's say that this person finds out that in their, their history, they come from a Scandinavian line. Now it just so happens that in the winters in Scandinavia, the way that people survived is by cramming themselves into a little hut. I mean, like a lot of people. Now I want you to think about doing that with, with like a, a group that's a lot more aggressive. Let's say you did that with a bunch of Brazilians or a bunch of, of people from Iraq, right? <laughs> What would happen in the springtime if you opened the door to that hut is that pretty much everybody would have killed each other. So what has to happen is there has to be a way that overcrowding is compensated for or adapted to. And in the Scandinavian cultures, part of that was to create emotional distance where there couldn't be physical distance. So this, this quality of being aloof evolved maybe thousands upon thousands of years ago, back when Scandinavians survived the wintertime in that way. But that aloof mannerism or way of being with each other, including with their own children, is something that would have been experienced as a child with your parents, and then you parent the same way, and then you parent the same way. Now, what we could be dealing with here is that a person is no longer in this situation where in the wintertime they are crammed in a hut somewhere, right? They're no longer even in the same country. Maybe this is somebody that moved to Mexico. We're now in a hot weather climate where that whole experience makes no sense. And yet this emotional aloofness is still something that is running through their being and destroying their adult relationships. That's ancestral. Here's another example. A person never knew their birth parents, right? But unlike their adoptive parents, they have an entrepreneurial streak. Unlike other people who feel no security, with the idea of all the finances depending on their own efforts, right? They're the person that really feels secure when they have a salary. <clears throat> it's almost like this person has this fear bone missing, but they have no idea why again, right? Because they're growing up with different parents. Now, when you look at their paternal birth father's line, you find that it's full of entrepreneurs, people who either already overcame that fear or who are missing that fear entirely. So what we're looking at there is a predisposition, right? Here's another example. Person comes from um, ancestry where people were early puritanical Christians. Because of this religion that they belonged to and believed in, they had a certain set of values, right? So those can be things like hard work, self-control, honesty, responsibility, family life, service, virtue. <laughs> and they believe in predestination, of course. Now, this person who we're talking about could potentially never have gone to church in their lifetime. And maybe their parents didn't either. I mean, they did not grow up religious, right? But it doesn't matter because due to so many people in this ancestral line, forming an attachment with these specific values and beliefs and due to many of these values being passively adopted and then demonstrated subconsciously by their parents and grandparents and maybe even a more extended family, maybe even cultures, <laughs> they've maintained ancestral values that originate from the 1600s and earlier and they don't even know it. Oh man, and when you look at a country today and the attitude in, within cultures today, you can't, you can't separate that picture of that, what you're looking at now from what was hundreds, thousands of years ago. Okay, next one. Let's say that a person has an ancestor, not just unanswered ancestor, let's say ancestors, plural, that were living in the Russian Pale of Settlement. This is an area in Russia where, where essentially Jews were allocated to live because they were prevented from living elsewhere in the country. But it's not like living there was just like a hunky-dory little Jewish, you know, community. 
they were <laughs> subjected to so much torture, so much lack of freedom in these areas. And then after that, the same family line experiences the horror of World War II. As a result, so many of these ancestors over multiple generations experienced the loss of their possessions again and again. <clears throat> so consequently, what happens? They become anxious and cautious with their possessions. This behavior, if not overtly talked about, you know, even if not overtly talked about, would be taught to their children by virtue of just the way that they behave. They behave as if there's no security, they can't hold on to anything, that overnight everything could be lost. So this deep-seated fear that somebody has of their stability not being something they can count on and that any moment something could be lost is something that can be carried in someone's gut. But they might look at their life and be like, what the hell is this from? It makes no sense. I grew up rich. I made myself even more rich. Like I've never had an experience like this. They have no idea that it's ancestral. <clears throat> What I want you to, to think about here when it comes to the, the influence of ancestry, too, is that there's an origin story for everything you're interacting with today. And I mean literally everything. That story has its roots in the past. That means ancestry is involved in everything. I'm talking everything that's happening, happening politically, every book you've ever read, every piece of art that's ever been created, every cultural practice that you engage in or interact with when you travel, every modern advancement that you enjoy, everything has its roots here in ancestry and in history, which is why I know a lot of you who are attending this uh, workshop today would consider yourselves people who really love shadow work, right? You love diving into the why, and, and based off of knowing the why, you know what to do about it, right? Shadow workers are, by definition, lovers of history. You, you literally cannot be interested in the why of anything on this earth and not be interested in history and not be interested in genealogy. Some of you may not have experienced this love aff affair that you're about to have with all of this yet. Um, it's only when you start to really grasp the implications of what I'm talking about here and you start to walk down that road that this full picture comes into play. And that picture is not only terrifying, it is sometimes terrifying, but it's not only terrifying, it's also super magic. Okay, so now that you have a little bit of the feeling of some of the effects that you might not recognize that have something to do with ancestral um, inheritance, let's just talk about ancestry in general and the impact that it has on a person, right? Ancestry has so much more to do with the experience you're having in the here and now than you can possibly imagine. I know that a lot of people were a little bit surprised when I was you know, announcing that I was going to do this workshop because they're like, well, that's confusing because Teal definitely doesn't dive into past lives or anything like that. She kind of deals with trauma about the here and now in our life. But I'm going to tell you, <laughs> ancestral trauma, it has so much to do with why you're doing what you're doing, where you are right now, what has happened, every pattern that's running through you. It is very much alive in the here and now. It's not in the past as much as we may wish that it was. Okay, so let's start with the story. Here's the story of, of how you started. And this is something that I feel like a lot of people have lost touch with, right? So I want you to think about starting with you, right? You have two parents, right? But from there, you have four grandparents. From there, you have eight grand grandparents, right? And so on and so forth. It took 4,000. 96 of your 10 times great grandparents for you to even exist. This is a beautiful picture if you have the capacity to grasp it. Why? Because the amount of energy that this universe has put into creating you is unreal. It's absolutely unreal. I mean, if you grasp this, your worth issues would just be gone. Why? Because I'm going to read this again. 4,096 10 times great-grandparents. Their existence is the only reason you are here. It took all of them to create you, just you sitting here in front of me. Not only that, the level of synchronicity that had to take place for you to be here. This is going to scare the crap out of you, okay? So let's say that, let's say that, um, let's just take your grandparents. Let's say that your grandfather gets shipped off to war. And he's shipped off to war to France. And this one day in France, he's like, you know what? I really miss American stuff. 
So he enters into a bar where he knows that other Americans hang out for the first time since he's in this country. Oh, weird. It just so happened that your would-be grandmother was inside of that room. Why? Because she was volunteering as a war nurse. So he meets her there. <laughs> Two minutes later, he doesn't meet her. That means your existence is dependent on a two-minute interval. Nothing about you would be the same if that did not occur. Now, every one of those synchronicities that goes into their meeting, everything that added up to you being eventually born, had to take place in the lives of 4,096 people. It is amazing when you sit here and think about that. So let's talk about ancestry in the picture of non-physical reality. Before you are coming into this time-space reality as a physical human, you're in a place where you're not limited in the same way that the human mind is limited. And so what you're doing is you're looking at all of these different potentials. And when I say all of these different potentials, I mean billions upon billions upon billions of potentials. What you are doing is you are observing the consciousness of your family lines. Now, you were observing more than just those family lines because you were looking at different potential parents. But let's just say you're focusing just on those two parents you're thinking about coming into. You observe the consciousness of the family line on both your mother and your father's line, as well as the expansion path in those family lines. What you were looking for essentially when you were doing this is a kind of a win-win scenario. You're looking for a family line that supports your expansion for your intention for this life. You are also looking for ways that you yourself and your intention for this life can contribute to the expansion of the overall consciousness of that family line. This is why you know I will tell you that each new progeny, like the babies that are born in each line are the progression of the desires of that family line, the progression of the best interests or the actualization of that family line. So we're looking at a win-win, right? You want to look at yourself being benefited by doing so and also by benefiting them. Now, it's not that you're just looking for positive things, though, because from that non-physical perspective, we see even negative elements within a family line as being something that, that ultimately is beneficial to our expansion in some way. So I want you to think about us coming into a family line as opting into like a deck of cards, some of those cards are like, mm, you know, some of the cards are like, woo, that's pretty groovy, right? Um, so I'll give you an example. Your ancestry might be extraordinary when it comes to the service of others, but in the same vein, there may be a repetitive pattern of unnecessary personal sacrifice that's also running through your family line. You'll also notice that many of the family's strengths contain the seeds of their weaknesses. Surprise, surprise. Okay, so genes. Genes are like a, a multi dimensional blueprint or code, they're not just physical. There are 12 dimensions to genetics. So it's a blueprint even for things like knowledge, things like desire, needs, affinities, preferences, aversions, phobias, aptitudes, inaptitudes, beliefs, feeling states, and memories. <laughs> you contain all the memories from all your ancestors. Are you conscious of all of them? No. Are all of them active? Maybe not, but you actually contain all of them. So what I want you to grasp right now, and this is really important to understand when you're trying to grasp why ancestral healing is so important, your family line and everything that has happened in that line is not out there in the world and it is not in the past. It is quite literally in you. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to do that one later. So let's talk about... You know, one thing that I want to say is that what's interesting for me is that we accept, as people, we accept the idea of, of ancestral inheritance, whether it's traumas or whether it's positive traits, when it comes to things like breeding animals. People who breed animals are like, oh, we got to make real sure, you know, who the dam is or who the sire is or, you know, whatever animal it is that they're breeding. They make absolutely sure because they're not ignorant to the fact that this stuff passes down. Personality traits, physical traits, like you name it. Most of us don't like the idea, though, of that when it comes to us as people, because it makes us feel like we're out of control. It makes us feel like we're at the mercy of our ancestry, like we can do nothing about it. But that's not true. In fact, one of the main things you were here to do is to do something about it. 
let's explain really fast the concept of direct versus indirect ancestral trauma. When we're talking about a direct ancestral trauma, we're talking about something where you had an experience directly with someone or something that was related to ancestral trauma of some kind, and it was that direct interaction with it that caused you to inherit that trauma. Here's an example of what I mean. Uh, let's say that, well, let's go back to the original example I gave you with the aloofness. So way back in the day, people had to crime themselves in a hut. They developed emotional aloofness as a way to sort of create distance where overcrowding would normally cause conflict. So a person, a child in that line would have directly experienced adults who were aloof directly, right? My mom and dad are direct with me are directly aloof with me because of whatever happened in the past. And because of my direct experience with them being aloof, that's the trauma that I got. That's direct. Indirect trauma is perhaps far more interesting <laughs> because it perplexes people. It's that, and this is already proven. This is like, this is not me just sitting here. I mean, there's plenty of science. You can go research on this one. Um, the idea that you can have no direct experience with something and still inherit the trauma. Now, I'm going to tell you about one, one um, experiment that was done that is particularly interesting. It was around mice and the scent of cherry blossom. So essentially, the scientists took the scent of cherry blossom and they exposed it to these male mice. But every time they, they exposed them to that scent, they would give an electroshock to their foot. So there's an association. It's just basic Pavlov. There's, a, there's an association with these mice and cherry blossom and, and oh, this is a bad thing as we get shocked. Now, what they did then is they removed these male mice from the females that they impregnated. So there was no way for the male mice to be in, in you know, interaction with those babies when they were born. But they also removed the mothers. So it, we were eliminating, essentially, when, when people did this, the potential that the male mice somehow communicated it to the female mice. So this doesn't happen, right? Um, they removed the female mice from the male and the male mice from the babies. These baby mice, for five generations, still showed sensitivity to the scent of cherry blossom. Okay. Oh, and yeah, there was a control group. I mean, you can go research it. But <laughs> essentially, it would make sense in an evolutionary way that if we experience some kind of trauma and we need to survive, we have to somehow make sure that our progeny has a sensitivity to that or, or is aware that it's a problem, right? Would react to it. I mean, a lot of scientists think this is why humans still have issues with snakes. So indirect trauma is where there is there is some kind of an ancestral trauma that's passed down, even though there's no personal interaction whatsoever with that. And by the way, in the ancestral course that I did, I got a little personal because I have one of these indirect traumas, which is absolutely crazy. <laughs> All right, we're just going after this. I think the next thing I want to say about ancestral trauma is that a lot of people make a big mistake here. They think that ancestral trauma is all about just the negative stuff or healing ancestral trauma or ancestral healing. It's all about figuring out what's wrong and fixing what's wrong, or it's about finding or connecting somehow spiritually to ancestors that suffered a certain way and setting them free in some way. And what they miss is that a big part, a big part of ancestral healing is not just about the negative, it's about the positive. It's about those incredibly positive resources and character traits and aptitudes and whatever that we may have cut ourselves off from or are not capitalizing on. It's about reconnecting to those and re-embodying those. That's to make the most out of our, our own family lines that we opted into. So for those of you that are afraid <clears throat> upon looking into this course that it's all just gonna be painful and it's all just gonna be negative, Actually, so much of ancestral trauma healing is so much fun. So much of it makes you 10 times stronger. I mean, stronger than you could possibly imagine. It helps you to recognize your positive traits. So I want you to think about this. The task that you've been born with is the task of, of um, resolving this inherited trauma. And that's part of what you opted into. So I don't want you to feel like sitting here in this life by virtue of having this sort of trauma, it's a detriment. You knew, you knew that this was what you were coming in to do. All of us did. 
We were looking at those negative patterns and in fact, very consciously opting into how we were gonna take responsibility for and change those, especially specific ones, depending on the individual. So this is another thing. What I notice in today's society is that people think they're doing kids a favor or themselves a favor by, by forgetting or by cutting themselves off from where they came from or who they came from in those stories. But actually they're not. They're cutting their children off and cutting themselves off from so many things, so many incredible things. And at a deep level, we all understand this, which is why, you know, in genealogy circles and in historical circles, it's this very common saying that what the grandfather wishes to forget, the grandson wishes to remember. <clears throat> So let's talk about, before I go into these questions, don't worry, we'll get there. I'm going to do a brief overview of, of some of the steps that it takes to heal ancestral trauma or bring about ancestral healing, right? <clears throat> know that when I did this course, I mean, it, you know how I do things, I break everything down to within an inch of its life, right? So um, each one of these things I'm, I'm walking people through in a very practical, tangible way in this e-course that I designed. but. The first thing that you're going to want to do when you're dealing with ancestral healing is you're going to want to work with the aspect of you that's in resistance to ancestral work in general. So there can be a lot of different elements of resistance that somebody has. I just mentioned one to you right now. Like, why do I, <laughs> this is just a detriment to me. Why the hell do I have to be responsible for fixing something I wasn't even freaking involved in? You know, like that's one, one example of, of resistance. You've got to deal with the resistance first. Otherwise, it's like you're working, you're always working against a resistant force. Second thing you're going to be wanting to do is research. Obviously, the more you know, the better this gets, right? And it is the better it gets, the better it gets. Uh, the second one that you're going to be wanting to do is, is what you want to reown and embody, right? So when it comes to ancestral healing, you want to, you want to find out what these positive um character traits or positive elements within the line are, and you want to reown them. You want to find a way to be like, wait a minute, this is actually in me. Why have I not been using this, you know, and actually use it in a much more conscious way. And the, the next part is what patterns you want to change. So that's consciously looking at the negative elements within your ancestry and being like, you know, <laughs> I don't think it actually benefits us as the family or myself to continue this. And so I'm going to be the one to change that pattern. The next one, you're going to be working around negative judgments that are and uh, they're sort of like causing a rejection of the people in your family line. Rejection of any member of your family is a problem when it comes to ancestral healing. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, a lot of people think that by rejecting somebody in their family line or rejecting something ancestral, that's going to make it so that they don't become that. And in fact, it's like a death sentence. <laughs> the resistance of these things within your family line make you them. So we want to think about that. But obviously, so the next part is we're resolving this negative judgment so that when we consciously work with negative patterns within the family line, we don't have that same you know, attitude of resistance to them because whatever we resist persists, we can't actually go deep enough if we're in resistance to something to understand something, to resolve something, to integrate something. Um, the other thing that we employ is things like meditative work. Um, I would tack on to the shamanic work, depending on your level of comfort <laughs> with shamanic work and stuff like that. But the meditation work or the journey work or stuff like that, that's the only part of ancestral tra trauma healing, honestly, that allows us to break down these barriers of past and present where we can have direct experiences with ancestors in the now. When most people talk about ancestral healing, most people are so limited in their perspective of ancestral healing that this is the only thing they're thinking about is some esoteric way to somehow connect with somebody who's been dead for 300 years, right? That is an aspect of, of healing ancestral work, but it's actually the smallest aspect, believe it or not. Okay, so the next one is picking a trauma to resolve and directly doing it. Also picking an ancestral karma to resolve and deliberately doing it. Now, what I'm doing with this with this uh, e-course that I designed is I'm giving you a template where you know exactly how to do any ancestral healing. I don't want you to think about ancestral healing as like a 
is like a one and done. It's like, oh, there's some ancestral healing each person has to do, and then they can get done with it. Actually, the entire process of your life and the entire process of healing that you're sort of on as a person in general in your life, that is a, a constant lifelong process. So ironically, a person is engaged in ancestral healing, whether they know it or not, for the duration of their entire life. So it's not like a one and done type of thing. So let's say that you might pick an ancestral trauma to resolve and resolve it. That doesn't mean that in 40 years, you might not be like, oh, wow, I just became aware of another one. Now I got to do that process with that one. Which is why I'm saying like, this is a template. By you know experiencing what it is that I'm doing in this e-course, by knowing how to sort of pick one of these traumas out and change the pattern, you'll know how to apply that anytime in the future that it comes up, right? <clears throat> so an ancestral karma, right? This is one that makes people really, really nervous because karma definitely is something that passes on and that's more complicated than people make it. If you want to know more about the way that karma actually works, I did do a video on YouTube about this. I think you just go go type in teal swan and karma. It'll be the first one that comes up. But um, karmas do pass down in family lines. And that's something that definitely you can take hold of. You can be the change for uh, the next thing that you want to be doing for ancestral healing is you want to embody the ancestral aptitude. Aptitudes are a big element of, of integrating and in, integrating ancestry and doing ancestral healing work. So let's say that you find out that in your family line, there's an aptitude towards something like music. You might choose a musical instrument. Maybe you are even aware of your ancestry enough to know what musical instrument it is. Maybe you pick it up and you develop that capacity. So you're re-embodying that ancestral aptitude. The next one is dissolving ancestral loyalty. In every family line, there's some kind of dysfunction. I've never seen an exception. There's some kind of a dysfunctional form of belonging. Um, that form of belonging and that, that sense of loyalty can be something that's a real detriment to an individual. I have definitely explained this, how this applies on a personal level within our own cultures when I'm saying that in a lot of groups that are poor, um, when they when the way that they cope with being in that position is by sort of hating wealthy people, for example, and then a sort of loyalty to the family is to fail and to stay poor. So all of a sudden, if somebody's like, well, I'm really hating this and I'd really like to, to create some abundance, oh, wait, but to be loyal to my people, I can't. That's a negative loyalty, right? And there are these running through family lines like crazy, ancestral ones that lasted from so long ago. And I, you know, I even watched this relative to, to hatred, hatred of other people. And you're watching this play out big time, especially in the Middle East right now, where you know a certain person is born into a family line where loyalty to that family means hatred of the other. And so now we've got a thousand plus year war and this is a definite element of it that if anybody tries to deal with it in a different way than hatred, oh, all of a sudden this is an ancestral loyalty that we're challenging. <clears throat> so this the next one is the opportunity to go to the ancestral lands. Now, obviously this is something which is only available to some people. I mean, you're extra lucky, I guess, if you're if you're living in a place near to where your ancestors are already from. But there's plenty of things you can do when you go back to your ancestral lands. And going back to ancestral lands, I can't even tell you what that does for people in terms of ancestral healing. And when you do that, of course, there are all kinds of all kinds of things you can do from walking barefoot there to, you know, researching the history that you can only find there because guess what? It may not be on the internet. And also drinking the water in that place. Now, I've gone so far in this e-course to suggest that if you can't get your hands on the water by virtue of going there, try to get your hands on it by finding somebody there to send you some. Because water actually is a, is a keeper of memory. So when you drink the water of your ancestors, you're reconnecting with the memory of your ancestors and the land that they belong to and the land that forged their being and their body. So drinking the water that your ancestors would have uh, would have had is... So incredibly powerful. It's like a reset, basically, but like an incredibly strong reset, obviously, because it's a reset that applies to so much of who you are, even on a genetic level. Okay, so again, this is my overview, running through why ancestral trauma is such a big deal, why ancestral healing and integration is such a big deal, um, 
why why a person should be doing it. It's going to completely transform your life. And also, you know, this is me announcing to you that I have done an e-course to walk you through this entire process. I've made it easy for you. I've made it so tangible <laughs> that it's like you can't not get it after that, which is super powerful. And it's not about digging around metaphysically in the past. I mean, that that in and of itself is something that is really not feasible for most people. I mean, most people on earth, let's take the average Joe walking down the street in a totally spiritually disconnected city. They could do ancestral trauma and in fact are without even knowing it just by virtue of living the life they're living. <laughs> it's just the more consciously you get on board with this, the more rich this experience gets. So now that you understand this, let's go to questions. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep talking. <laughs> All right. The first question is from Sydney Mitchell. Her question is, why are you inspired to create an ancestral healing course at this time? Is there larger forces in the universe benefiting this type of healing at this time or something you've experienced lately that has inspired you? Okay, let's talk about why I created this course. Um, I train people in the completion process, which is a process that people use to heal trauma in their here and now life. Now, as part of my training, I explain to people how much ancestral trauma plays into the trauma they're experiencing in their here and now life. And what struck me as odd every time I did this training is this look would come over people's faces when I would explain, like, you know, something like, you know, an example, any of the examples I gave you in the beginning. And people would go almost white, like, okay. I can barely deal with the fact that my own parents were disconnected emotionally or abandoned me as a child. I don't need to add to that. Oh, by the way, I'm carrying trauma from World War I. You know? <clears throat> so the first reaction I get is that people go ash white. And then all of a sudden there's like a, a panic because for most people, I was realizing that this is very intangible for them. Ancestral healing is like, Wah. it's like nebulous. Like, how do I hold on to it? How do I even know what it is? if it's something that happened so long ago that I don't even know it, right? So people were feeling like they were fumbling around in the dark. And it occurred to me, well, wait a minute. People don't know how to heal ancestral trauma. For them, it is abstract. So I wanted to make it abstract for people. Make it abstract, that's great. Sorry, I wanted to make it, I wanted to make it tangible and practical for people. And I wanted to, to pose it to them in a way where there was no confusion anymore where I, they could sit down at coffee or tea across from somebody and be like, let me tell you about ancestral trauma. Let me tell you about ancestral healing and what it's really about and how you're actually engaged in it, even though you don't know it. And, 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 and there would be no confusion about how to go about it. No confusion about any of the elements of it. <laughs> it would be a full picture. Why I'm so interested in doing it at this time is ancestral trauma absolutely has to do with where we are in the world right now. Because you can't separate ancestry from cultures, and you can't separate ancestry from countries either. The picture of what we're doing today has its roots in the past. So much of what we are a match to right now and what we're headed towards in the world, in a, in a sort of global political way, is the result of ancestral trauma on a mass scale. So the same way that an individual family line can go through an experience and therefore there's these traits running through that family line, the same is true of, of let's say, zoom out and say that a, a human family as one culture or a human, a human family as one country, right? So let's say that an entire country has this type of, of trauma in their history. And because of it, they've got this certain pattern. Because of that certain pattern, they're going to make a political decision that essentially makes it so that human beings go extinct. I mean, we, we are facing right now on Earth, we're facing a multitude of potential extinction factors, honestly. And not just extinction factors, we're talking about suffering factors. And so many of those things have their roots in the past, have their roots in our ancestors, in fact. So we are at a, a juncture right now where our survival, quite frankly, depends on changing these patterns that have been running through us since so long ago. Obviously, I will be talking about this to people who are in charge. I will be talking about this in terms of this global scale thing. But when you were asking, well, what do I do about this? This seems like this is a, you know, a task that's way above and beyond me. You have to realize that you're, a, you're an aspect of the society. So as an individual, what you can do is to take the sort of bull by the horns. That's an American expression. You take the bull by the horns and are like, all right, I'm going to do this in me. 
I'm going to start looking at these detrimental patterns that are running through my family line. You don't know that those apply to the patterns that are running through your culture and your country and therefore your politics, but they do. <laughs> and you're going to be the one to change it with yourself. That's what you do have control over. So right now, yes, a big motivation for me is to orient people towards ancestral healing individually because the, the collective ancestral healing is what's going to make us make drastically, radically different social choices, which will affect everything from the way the structure of society to the way the politics are run to the way that businesses develop to the decisions we make with AI to the decisions we make with the planet to, to everything. So yeah, I have some real motivation right now about ancestral healing because it is so applicable right now and so important right now. <clears throat> that was awesome. Next question is from Sananda. You can turn on your video and sound now. Hello. Sananda. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? I can hear you. I see that you're unmuted. The video isn't working. Okay. Oh, oh my. my. Okay, we can hear can you now. Me? Yes, um, it seems like your video is not able to turn on, but why don't you go ahead and ask your questions just um, through audio? Sure, no problem. Okay, so I have researched into Genia. First of all, hi, I respect you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. Um, I've researched into genealogy and I have like 14 different nationalities. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I feel like I have multiple different stories and traumas and like everything. And I'm assuming some contradictory traumas and like groups of people who have been historically at odds with each other. Yep. Right. So me and my I brother. I hope you see the beauty. I'm going to stop you right now. I hope you see the beauty in that because this is very common. This is very, very common. If you're looking at this from the top down from, you know, let's, let's call it source perspective. If you're interested in getting the full picture and interested in healing, wouldn't it benefit you to come in as the slave master and the slave, for example? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so, but what are, I just wanted to know what your thoughts are for how to go about ancestral healing for someone with such mixed ancestry. What you're going to do is you're going to focus on it in terms of chapters. So, I, I mean, right now, it, when you've got this much of a sort of multi, uh, multi-dimensional picture of your ancestry, and it's, you, instead of having like very strong themes, you've got like multiple themes, you just want to deal with whatever it feels like is the most up right now. So like, let's say, Let's say that I had an issue with emotional abandonment and I'm noticing that in my relationships and I'm noticing in my parents and I start to trace that back and I start to see that that, that line runs through, let's say a line that came from England. Because that's so up right now, I'm going to treat that like a layer of the healing onion that is ready and wanting to be healed. And so I'm going to be focusing more on that particular aspect of my family. Okay. When I feel like I've broken through that and the next pattern comes up, that might trace down a whole different line. So, so does that make sense? Kind of, you're going to address it in, in chapters according to what's appearing now. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. I think I've just been hesitant because I just feel like it's going to be so much, but that's life, I guess. <laughs> well, the good news is, is that we talked to me about that. Cause I actually think I, I noticed this trend with people feeling like this is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So wh when you think that thought, like this is so overwhelming and I don't know how to just, <laughs> this is what is it that's fueling that thought? Like, what do you imagine you're going to experience that is making it so overwhelming? Well, to me, honestly, like my parents, like literally my parents' relationship and my my relationship with my parents was overwhelming enough. So to think that there's like 4,000 of them, like, I'm just like, <laughs> I couldn't possibly, you know, and like, I guess it's it's what I chose. So I'm capable of it, but yeah. Okay. So this is a projection. And this is quite common. And it's one of the main reasons why people don't go towards their ancestry is because of a painful relationship they have with just the people they had interaction with. Mm. Um, what you will find is that there's no such thing as a family tree full of only bad apples. Mm -hmm. Now, I am also going to tell you that bad apples should be questioned. <clears throat> but Right now you're going at this with the with this sort of attitude of all you're gonna run into is is painful stuff and all you're gonna run into is 
painful people and all you, uh-huh. what you're not seeing yet is that so many of your ancestors were incredible, absolutely incredible. Not only that, there may be a sense of belonging you had with like a third grade grandfather or something that, uh-huh. that was so unfathomable to you because of the relationship you had with your immediate parents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I see that. Yeah. It's not just going to be like you think it is, where it's just pain and it's just pain and it's just pain. There are going to be things you find out at every juncture of this process, which is like, oh, that's super painful to look at. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's not just a one dimensional painful experience. Yeah. I think what I struggle with is holding like the greatness and the badness because that's that's the same for my parents. Like yeah. there's, the both thing going on. So like, I, I want to see things as one thing or another. And it's that even that in itself is overwhelming for me. If that makes sense. (laughs) Why do you think it's so hard for you? Like, I understand, I understand the desire, but um, because that's, I mean, most people want things to be black and white because it's simpler that way. But Mm -hmm you know, when you think about why is it so hard for me to, for there to be both, why is it so hard? Um, what does that change for you? I guess, I guess like it makes it so I don't know how to be around people like I feel like I want to switch or I'm like this person's good so I can relax or this person's bad so I need to be have my guard up you know um this is getting into way more but um, no it's fine I mean, no, no but no this is when you're saying this is getting into way more now I'm proving to you right now how ancestral trauma has to do with the struggles you have in your day to day right now see yeah <laughs> ancestral does bleed into this mm. so I would expect it to be like we're going in this direction it's not a different direction Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay so what i want you to recognize is that you're you're adding issues around sort of boundaries or issues around not knowing what to do with the information mm. to the concept of both can be true at the same time so so i want you to separate those two out two can be true at the same time and now what do we do about it the good news about your ancestors is there's no way for you to have them in your life physically <laughs> yeah so those boundaries that you're struggling with relative to your parents like not knowing where to put them in the good camp and therefore you know how to keep them in your life or the bad camp and therefore knowing what boundaries you can set you don't have to deal with those with your ancestors mm. <laughs> it's much more like in the ether and i i'm better at that anyway so yeah <laughs> okay thank you okay thank you bye Next, we have Zila. Okay. Zila, you may begin to ask your question once you unmute yourself. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay. Can you see me? No, we're just going to have to go with audio this time around. Oh, really? Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so thank you, Teal, so much for everything you do. And yeah. Um, so my question is Is it possible that my an- ancestors are not aligned with me? Um, I sometimes feel that I'm going against them or in opposition to them. Um, And also, do people come into your life as temporary partners who are actually your ancestors trying to suck you back into their ways? Um, And how can I know if I'm moving in the right direction or if I need to be more with or in line with my ancestors? I don't know that much about the whole area. So when you, the first thing that I noticed when you asked this question is that there, there's already some kind of a sense of a a war with your ancestry mm-hmm. you notice that even in like well is it possible that they can inc- can incarnate as temporary partners to suck you back into what they're wanting it's it's like this is a very adversarial relationship you've got with them yeah right now when did that start and where do you think that comes from um well i was 
Yeah, I mean, I wonder if it could be because, um, you know, I wonder if it could be to do with, like, it could be parts of myself, like warring with parts of myself. It could be um, struggles with my parents. Um, Did you feel like your parents wanted something for you despite what you wanted for yourself? And that's still an unresolved issue. Did my parents want something for me that I didn't want? Did they expect me to behave in a certain way and do things? Yes, definitely, always, yeah. So this is what I would consider to be another projection. It's where the relationship with the parents is projected upon the totality of the ancestry, mm. which is part of why it's so important to get in touch with these ancestors and to start learning about them as much as you can. Because what you'll find is, is often that the very values which your parents essentially imposed on you in a sort of their ways that they required you to be aligned with that you weren't actually aligned with were not something that was shared by many of your ancestors. In fact, they would have made completely different decisions based off of completely different values <laughs> way back in the day. Like maybe you can trace, you know, the values they had or the things they imposed on you to a single experience that was had at some point in history. And that's when it changed. Yeah, maybe. I, I definitely, though, feel that, um, like, I come from the north of England, on both sides of the north of England. And I feel like there's a kind of, a sort of harshness and a... Um, like hardness and um, like got to get through it, and almost anger or... Um, yeah, so what you're describing, so this is good. Yeah. So you're somebody who's working with a theme, a very strong theme. When we come into almost like the more pure your bloodlines get, the more you're trying to work solidly with a theme, right? So you've got a very strong theme, like the one that you just described. But what I need you to see is that that is an adaptation. So the question is, is that necessarily a way, like, a, like something that your ancestors are aligned with, or was that an adaptation to some trauma they experienced? Like, for, for, I'll give you an example. You can see this in somebody else's life. Um, no, I did, I did it earlier. Remember how I said that, that basically if you've got a whole group of people that are experiencing poverty, they may adapt to that. Mm -hmm in dysfunctional ways by saying like, you know, well, sc screw the monarchy and screw people with money and people with money are evil and they only care about themselves. So you're almost like developing this negative narrative and glorifying poverty, right? Mm -hmm. That's an adaptation. Can we then say that that's their way? I can tell you that when many beings die from their perspective after death, they're looking back at their life and looking at those adaptations like, I would wish it didn't have to be that way. I mean, at some point, your ancestors were these little babies that oh, okay. were in your position. Being like, oh, no, I want to play, but I'm not allowed to play because I have to be so serious or whatever it was. So uh, many of these uh, like ways mm. that that each generation adapts and therefore becomes the same as the past is not necessarily something that your ancestors are behind any more than the four-year-old is really behind. Oh no, now I have to become somebody who's like, <laughs> there's no joy in life for me anymore, you know? Mm. So, so this is what oh, I, I like. Mean. So much of, of who you are is meant to be the pattern changer for this. So it's like, what part of your ancestors are you going to respond to? Their adult selves that, that adapted dysfunctionally or their child selves and what would have been the best if they came into an environment? So when you're up against something like this, where you have that sense, like, I, I, I'm just, I'm, I feel like I'm doing something against their ways. Yeah, because you're the pattern changer. So you mm -hmm. almost have to step back and look at your family line objectively and be like, does this actually serve us? I mean, it's not, it's not, even in the way you're sort of approaching your family, it's like, you're this small and your family is this big thing, right? Mm. And that's almost to not step up into your place in this whole picture and be like, no, I'm a member of this family. Like, I'm sorry. I'm looking at us as a collective. Is this good for us? <laughs> if not, it's like, no, I'm going to help you guys. Guys being nice. Sometimes it's like, I'm going to help you fuckers. Like, <laughs> I'm going to quit this, you know? 
yeah i i do really feel that that like i feel yeah tiny in that huge kind of river and like i'm being kind of sucked down it their way and i'm kind of the little salmon trying to go the opposite direction sort of thing and and that yeah. is how each member of your family for so many generations since this pattern began has been oh no i have to adopt their ways oh no i have to adopt their ways so the question is when does it end and what i wish i could show you a picture of is that so many of your ancestors now having exited their temporal forms and and are looking at this from a more objective perspective are like come on Please be the one to do it. You know, <laughs> I feel that so often as well. Like I'll go into a new situation, and and suddenly I just feel like, oh yeah, I have to adopt all of their ways, and I'm constantly kind of trying to resist that. Do it. It's really yeah, a lot. So is that is that a good enough answer to your question or no? Because you're you're not going against your ancestors in what you're doing. You're yeah, I feel like that benefit them either. Yeah, really. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I love this topic. <laughs> okay. Next person will be Adele. You can just unmute yourself. Well, while she is attempting to join the chat, if anything, I can read out loud her question. Is it one I'm going to be able to answer without elaboration? Uh, potentially. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> actually, in the meantime, if she's struggling to get on, I will just bring on. Oh, yep, yeah, she's joining. Okay. Hello, Adele. If you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was driving. <laughs> so tell, what's your question? So my question is, um, there are a lot of uh, women in my family uh, that have stayed single uh, for their whole life. And um, I feel like I'm kind of uh, doomed to be the next one. And I don't know what to do. Uh, I'm really scared to be the next one who's going to be single. Uh, hello, life. Why are you so afraid to be single? Because what's interesting in, in I don't know whether you relate to this or not, but the, there's a pattern in your voice almost that's making it confusing as to whether you really want a relationship or whether your fear of being single your whole life is about something totally else, like opinions. Um, no, I think I, I would like to be in a relationship. Um, mm -hmm. but I know, I know I, I kind of, I am the one always leaving. I'm, I'm the one messing in every, every time. I'm the one, um, making it not work. I'm the one leaving before it starts. Um, but I, I don't know how to <laughs> make it work. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so explain something to me because in this in this pattern that you're describing is is a, a terror of how the people in your family are going to see you if you're single. Can you speak to that a minute for me for a minute? Uh, yeah, I've I've um, there is one aunt and one great aunt that I've known. I've, I've been single their whole life, and yeah, we basically make fun of them or we 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 see less of them because they are single. And my mom kind of always say, don't be this, this, um, like, don't be like your aunt. And, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So when you're trying to heal this dynamic around this, the single being the fear of being single, you're going to need to separate these two things out and address them as two different layers. 
right? There, the one layer is what you are practically doing to sabotage relationships. <laughs> the other is you got to change your attitude towards the family disapproval. Okay. Because that you see, those are two different problems, right? You are, it's almost like resolving your trauma and changing your perspective around the disapproval of being single is over here. That's causing huge problems. It's actually adding to this. Totally separate from that is the behaviors that you're tangibly doing that are sabotaging relationships. Um, the good news is there might be, I mean, you could potentially look back at these two ants, right? And you could start to look at the why that they are single. Um, whether it's by choice or whether it's not by choice, choice, if it's not by choice, what is it practically that they are doing to end up this way? See if there are any mirrors or any um, reflections in your life and in their life. The similarities, right? Have you seen okay. any of these? I'm not sure. Well, that's, um, the, that's the next place to take this. So if I'm you, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to take a real conscious look at these, these two women in the family. And I'm going to see if there are any themes for ways that they're behaving, um, opportunities they're not taking, reasons they're doing or not doing the things that they're doing. And I'm, I'm going to try to see if I'm doing the same things. Uh, yes. Okay. There is one thing I see um, now. Um, <laughs> There's, um, so my, my aunt, uh, she um, kind of always stayed with uh, her parents, my grandparents, and she was kind of uh, the one um, taking care of them. And um, the two brothers, my dad and my, my uh, uh, uncle, um, they had their family and they left and everything. And so when, when my grandparents came um, uh, to heal and to hold to be by themselves, like my aunt was kind of stuck and she was like, really pissed at uh, her brothers uh, for being the one taking care of everything. And I have three brothers, and um, my parents are younger, obviously it's not the same thing, but obviously I kind of feel like I might be the one taking care of them um, someday, because my brothers have started their families, and I haven't. And... Um, yeah, and I don't want to be pissed at my, at my brothers like my aunt was uh, with my father for starting a family because I'm happy for my brothers to to have a family. But um, yeah. There so is obligation, that... obligation is an element that is feeding into this for sure. <laughs> okay, so what, the position that you're in here is to make real conscious choices about how you want to how you want to change that pattern. How do you want to behave differently than they behaved? So as, so as to not end up in that same position, this being one of those elements, there could be multiple aspects to it. Like, um, you know, they could be, it could be this pattern of obligation is one element that's sort of walking you down this ancestral path of spinsterhood, right? <laughs> so you got to change your perspective enough to make a different action, take a different decision than your ancestors did, right? That's one piece of it. A next piece of it could be, I mean, I'm just literally throwing stones out here, but a next element could be, I end relationships before they start. Okay, why am I doing that? So th then, then it just becomes healing just like anything else. Why am I here in my life right now ending relationships before they really start? Is it a fear that I have? I mean, do you have an answer to this? Is it a fear that I have that I'm trying to avoid? Okay, if it's a fear that I have that I'm trying to avoid, Look at what I'm doing. The alternative is, is that I'm committing to aloneness. Am I willing to commit to aloneness because it's better than the fear on the other side or the experience on the other side? Do you, yeah. you understand? You're, um, you're, you're kind of seeing yeah. how much I, it's not that you're, you're in a, what I want you to get is that it's not that you are fated to repeat these patterns because of, of these ancestors in your lines, right? Okay. Yeah. It, no, it is, it, what it is, is that you're probably gonna do the same stuff. And because of it, line yourself up with the same fate. It's just nothing but re repetition of patterns. Okay. So the power that's in your hand, I mean, it's gonna be, obviously this is gonna be a much more in-depth journey than I can just sort of run you through right now. Yeah, but, sure. but that in-depth healing journey is find the pattern. Don't repeat the pattern. Do something different. What would the pattern change be from what your ancestor did in that moment? 
if this is what led them to Spencer Hood, how do I do a different pattern? If this is what led them to Spencer Hood, how do I do a different pattern? What are the things I'm doing right here and right now? It may have amplified over time. You know, your parents' interaction with you may have made it so that you behave a certain way in relationships. That could relate to how they were parented and how they were parented. So it could be an ancestral trauma, but still right here and now by virtue of your experience with your parents, you might have some sort of a behavior in relationships that is a, an absolute doomed pattern. How do you change the perspective so you can change the decisions so you can change the actions? That's the change of pattern. Yeah. All makes right. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Okay. It's, 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 it feels like a lot of work, but it makes sense. It feels like a lot of work, but it is the better it gets, the better it gets. Like I'm telling you, you change one of these patterns and it's like the level of freedom this is what I'm going to tell you. So like, even though most people are unaware that they're actually doing ancestral work, just when they're trying to improve their own life, they don't even need to know that it's related to ancestry. They're already doing it. When you have the awareness that this is an ancestral pattern and you shift that pattern, it's like, it's like changing an out of control train that's been going for thousands of years. I can't even explain to you the level of relief. It's like the relief you usually get with like a basic pattern. It's like, you can feel it doing that throughout time and space. And it's like, there's this collective family consciousness elevation, which is, wow, I mean, it is so amazing. So it's well worth it. And it's not like, it's just going to feel like work. And then you kind of get somewhere. It's going to be like work. Oh, oh, I can breathe, you know? Yeah. Right. And I, I, I have two baby nieces that I, I love dearly. And I, and I, I want to change it so they don't have like end up in the same thing too. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Teal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, All right. Next, we have Sonia. Sonia, you can begin to ask your question now. Hey, um, my question is, how do you discern whether something requires ancestral healing versus non-ancestral healing? Okay, why? so why would you want to know, is my question. Um, my question is because I have heard this term ancestral healing up quite a lot pretty much this whole week, and not just your content, but I'm also really, I guess I've been on this healing journey for a while, especially with your content. And I'm just wondering why all of a sudden does this ancestral healing word term come up where, um, like, is that a particular kind of healing that's different to, um, I don't know, I guess normal healing? And should this be something that um, is important to look at? Um, like outside, down that rabbit hole as well. so here, here's the answer outside of like real spiritual practices or real shamanic practices <laughs> the really esoteric stuff outside of that which is just one way that you can approach this no it's not different what ancestral healing ultimately is is the recognition of these patterns that need to change and their origin story the origin story of them being far in the past and with people that came before you Okay. So, I mean, I guess I to elaborate further in the context of healing when we do um, in a child work or work on our that's ancestral timeline. timeline. Yeah, that's that's what I was wondering. I was like, well, then how is it's not really any different, is it? Is no, it still that's, just that's what I'm trying to get people to get. So literally, right, and this is the good news for people who have, I still want people to do research, okay, but like this is the good news for people who, let's say they were adopted into a family and they have no access to anything regarding their birth family. And let's pretend we live in a world where there's no genetic testing. Okay, so in that type of a world, <laughs> um, a person who is engaged in any type of healing whatsoever could potentially be engaging in ancestral healing without even being aware of it. Cause like, let's say that, let's say that, um, let's think of a pattern. Okay, let's, let's take like the fear of success. A person could be just working on their fear of success, which we know is not really a fear of success. We're afraid of some consequence that comes with it. 
whether it's pressure or responsibility or whatever it is. Okay, so a person is just in a workshop working on themselves and their issue with success. Guess what? That could have been the very same thing that belonged to their birth father and their birth father's father and their birth father's father's father. And it could trace back to some kind of a horrible experience. And because of that, it was just passed down and inherited, kind of like that cherry blossom experience smell, right? So there, there is no, there's, there's like no need, quote unquote, real need for a person to have to have all that information. They're engaging in ancestral trauma, whether they want to or not. Because you chose to come in as the progression of that. That's why you chose these, these genetics that contain all these non-physical aspects to them and physical aspects to them. It's literally the cards you're working with. So what's non what's the opposite of that then? I mean, if it's ancestral healing as a definitive term for healing, what's the is there well, another term for it? No, but 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 let's say let, this is how I would how I would basically define the difference between ancestral healing and non ancestral healing. Mm -hmm. Let's say that your ancestors forever, you know, had this one experience and that was a you know an okay thing for them. But then, like in in your lifetime, you experience a war. This is one reason why when wars start, I'm like, okay, because the ancestral implications, or I should say, the progeny implications. Um, Let's say you experience a war, and because of that ex that very experience that you went through in that war, unlike the rest of your, your ancestors, you had to adapt in a different way. So there's always an origin story for, the, for a certain adaptation. That may be with you. Now, obviously, that wouldn't be ancestral healing then. That would be a healing relative to your experience yourself. Are you going to pass that on and make it in that moment? ancestral trauma that then goes and gets passed on or are you going to heal that and it relates to you in this life just now interesting so, so ancestral trauma is really you're just working with patterns that began before your existence mm -hmm. and all of us are doing that by virtue of interacting with our parents and ironically even if we're adopted we're dealing with ancestral you know stuff just in a very different way even with our adoptive parents but that's often by design What's so interesting when you watch these entities come into adoption experiences is that so often they're actually looking to receive the antidote to something that was running through the birth family line and vice versa, to introduce something that's running through the birth family line to that adoptive line. Sometimes, in fact, the universe is so done, like so tapped out, and, and it's not just the universe sort of imposing this on families. Families themselves are so stuck in a pattern that, that you know, the, this universe is like, you know what? No children for you. You get to have someone else from a different line who's mastered a different thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. So it's kind of like a repackaged term for it. Is that one way to put it? The, re the reason that, I, so, so the reason why I like using the term is it implies that you in your healing are looking at the origin of the pattern mm, okay. beyond just your life. It's almost just okay. like taking healing and like supercharging it. Woo. I experienced with that, that with my parents, but is that where the pattern started? Oh my gosh. No. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I guess like your first question to me about why, but I want to know, is it more significant to do ancestral, sorry, ancestral healing than to do those adaptive, adaptive sorts of healing where we're adapted from that family line? Hopefully you would be doing both, but the reason why ancestral trauma is so much more impactful usually is because when a vibration, like any, any adaptation or any choice you make is essentially a vibration. I just want you to think about it like that. When multiple people feed into that same choice or that same pattern, it amplifies. So when we're working with ancestral trauma, it's been amplified by this person, that person, this person, that person. It just gets bigger, 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 bigger. So usually when you make those shifts in those healing patterns, it's like, like I said, that. Mm. Type well, of I, I remember now, actually, that was specifically why I asked in the first place. It's like, so say I'm sitting in healing therapy with maybe a CP practitioner and then suddenly something comes up. Do I need to know whether that's ancestral healing or not? Like, does that make a difference? You don't necessarily need to. I mean, I, honestly, knowledge, I, I don't want you to get like all spun out on the idea that, that you absolutely have to know because you don't. 
You don't absolutely have to know. And working on any pattern that's active in your life right now is going to lead you to ancestral healing, whether you know that it's ancestral healing or not. Right? Like, I, I mean, knowing, like I'll give you an example. If, if I've got abundance issues, me focusing on fixing those abundance issues here and now can take place regardless of whether I know or don't ever know that it has something to do with my history. What I notice is that information, like the knowledge that it did start somewhere else, changes things for people, right? Sometimes it changes things in real beneficial ways. Sometimes it's much less personal. That's the thing I notice the most with ancestral healing as it runs through family lines when people become aware of, especially direct traumas with their parents when they're like, oh, wait, and that's exactly the same thing my parent went through. And that's the exact same thing that their parent went through. All of a sudden, what I notice is almost like a detachment or a depersonalization, which is quite beneficial because it means we can approach that that healing attitude from a, a less personal space. It's not about me and my parents doing this to me. It's about, all right, objectively, I'm watching a family line with a freaking issue. And yeah, it impacted me. Does that make sense? So so the knowledge uh, you know, in and of itself can change things in a person's healing experience. Um, it can also yeah. give, give us access to like, like, let's say that I know I'm dealing with an ancestral pattern that has to do with, you know, Ireland or something. Potentially taking myself physically to Ireland is going to be a nice, nice sort of antidote to whatever it is that I'm experiencing. It just sort of opens up more resources. Um, where I have an issue with, with this thing and, and where it's almost like when people usually ask the question you're asking, it's almost like they don't want the responsibility. It's like, I want to know that it's an ancestral trauma versus mine because I don't want to take the responsibility for it. And I'm like, well, that's the problem because <laughs> opting in to this family line means you literally consciously took responsibility for it. Yeah. So it's yours anyway. Like it, so this is why it's like, you know, we could have a conversation around splitting hairs around whether something is or is not ancestral trauma, but at the end of the day, it's solved the same way. <laughs> it's you, yeah. you, it's yours. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Is that, is, that a, that. is that a good enough answer? Yeah, that's pretty comprehensive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Hi, right, Lisa. You can unmute yourself now. Hello. Hello. Hi. Oh my God! I'm so happy to meet you. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Hi, Tia. Hello. Um, so my question is similar to the last question. I something that's repeating in my life is this feeling of not getting my needs met in my relationships, particularly my friendships, but I think it, it's rooted in my family relationships. And Sometimes I, I feel when I look at my life and like the issues I have and like the way I feel, I have a sense that like I should have more trauma than I have. Or when I look back on my childhood, it doesn't feel like enough to leave such a void in me um, because I look around at others and they don't seem to have so many needs that I do. Take and I wonder. Ready? I'm just going to cut you off. Take out a piece of paper, write down on the paper. Go watch Teal Swan's video on emotional neglect. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that is a big part of the issue. Oh, no, um, that is the issue. So why do my siblings, I guess, not have similar responses to it? They all seem very well-rounded compared to me. Okay, ready. I'm about to demolish the concept for you. Most people think that children that grew up in the same household had the same childhood. No child that grows up in the same household had the same childhood. Yeah. Period, the end. I should turn that into a quote. Period, the end. Every child in a household has a different childhood, different experience, is part of a different dynamic. Yeah. That's and the dynamic that they were a part of and the influences they had that you didn't experience just by virtue of the different role they played with different time they were born, what was happening at that time, they adapted to it differently. Okay. You cannot look at your siblings and how they're, they're functioning or not functioning, what their perspective is, as any reflection on your childhood. 
<laughs> they did not have your experience. Yeah. It's very I, I guess I feel I feel a lot of the times like uh, I don't know if this if I'm like in the relationships with the wrong people or but I I have a feeling like I have more needs than others emotionally and I don't know if that's like an ancestral thing or if that's it's people emotional. are just I'm not able to meet my needs and that's why it's they a, think that they're too it's much. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's a developmental response to emotional neglect. That's your answer. I've given you your answer, like straight up. It's not complicated. It's okay. an emotional, this is a developmental re, um, response to emotional neglect. Emotional neglect creates a developmental delay. So yeah. what you're experiencing is developmental trauma. Okay. Does that apply to your ancestry? Absolutely, it does. Because emotional neglect definitely runs through your family. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So how do, what do I do? Heal it with yourself. It's not like, I mean, like you going backwards and like fixing the sort of emotional neglect for your great-grandfather or great-grandmother is not going to happen. Yeah. recognizing that it comes through your family line, which I do want to challenge you a little bit. I want you to look for it. Once mm -hmm. you, I, you know, first, you got to learn about emotional neglect. I mean, this needs to become like a, Oh, I really get this concept. Then you got to take that concept that you grasp and you got to back apply it. Look at your relationship between your grandparents and parents and then great grandparents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. You're going to start to see this running through the line. Then you're like, you know what? I'm becoming the change to this. What is needed? Now with developmental, you know, traumas, it's quite simple. You needed what you didn't get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think I have some beliefs that there's nobody there's nobody available or there's nobody I don't know if it's where I live, but I feel like because it's such a cultural thing as well, like I feel like I can't have what I need because most people are not available to give that because of their own experiences of emotional neglect I don't feel like I meet a lot of people that are that give as much to relationships as I give and then I always feel disappointed and I think it makes me feel like giving up I know um it, well part of it is that you gravitate towards people who feel the same okay so you're trying to like unconsciously you're trying to get a person who who sort of gives you the emotional signature of familiarity which is the very people who have the issue to suddenly be able to give you the issue. That is all of us are trapped in these patterns with our parents, by the way. That's why you see a, you know, a woman who's like, God, oh, I don't want to be abused. But like, you're like, well, what the, why do you keep going for the same types of guys? You know? Um, yeah. I don't want you to make it like, Oh, it's just about the people where you live. But I will tell you that culturally and racially, there are definitely themes, which is why, you know, before I say this, I'm going to be like full disclosure here. When you're doing <laughs> ancestral work, you cannot be politically correct because so much of what you have to look at is racial instead of being like, Oh no, we're all the same. You have to literally look at how we're all different. So, so here's my new joke. My new joke here is that for so many of us, when we're dealing with ancestral trauma, you know, we're, we're deliberately trying to engage with other, other cultures who have the antidote to what it is that we're experiencing. So I don't know, many of you who are watching this may know Graciela, who's my right hand, who comes from a Mexican family, but her and I constantly make this joke about the uh, YD adoption programs. <laughs> Because yeah. it's like some of these more ethnic cultures that with the medicine almost they have is this sense of belonging and, and almost like meeting more of these emotional needs than the whites do. So it might be beneficial to break out of your race, even when you're looking for somebody who can offer these types of things, especially when it comes to, you know, if you're, if you're on the sort of, if you've got emotional neglect, you might have a, a big issue with regulating your emotions, for example. And there are cultures, Latin cultures specifically, that have no issue regulating each other's emotions. It's not something that they struggle with. They're not like, no, 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 that's on you, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes I think about leaving my town, but I guess that's not like the solution either so or, I, maybe I gotta... it is. or maybe it is yeah i mean I, it'd be interesting for me to come to your town and walk around i might walk around for an hour and be like yeah uh time to get out of dodge 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> what I wanted you to do is to really be objective about it. So instead of sort of operating with this loose kind of opinion of no, there's nobody here, I feel like, why leave it in the realm of I feel like? Why not just go really, really search? Is there anybody who's in my area who genuinely can and wants to do X, Y, Z? You just got to know what that is that you're needing, which is looking at the emotional needs that were not met in your childhood. Now, if, yeah. if you're looking around, you're like, yeah, this is definitely like a cultural thing that's not changing then you go outside your culture and if that means you move you move okay yeah i think i i think i get it thank you and believe me your ancestors are going to be like did you say you're moving to mexico <laughs> <laughs> so should i go to mexico is that a sign <laughs> keep it in the back of your mind okay <laughs> thank you okay Okay, Carmen, you can unmute yourself now. Hello, Kirill. Hello. So nice to meet you from Brussels. I'm Romanian, but I'm living in Belgium. Okay. You are talking a lot about breaking the patterns. And my question is based on the fact that we are half mother, half, uh, half father. So basically we need to, to heal the both lines. So yeah. how are we going to break the lines of the father of, illnesses for example the cancer which which is in the father's line and also for the mother's line uh, i'm seeing that my children they are behaving like me like i was behaving uh, with my mother and i'm behaving like my mother so basically when how do we know that we solved our ancestral traumas how the how what are the indicators that we are breaking these patterns? Well, the, so let's go to the dad's line first, right? So with cancers, you've got, you've got a, um, essentially a, a family line where when there's pressure on needing to make a change, the person doesn't make a change. And more pressure on making a change, the person doesn't make a change. And so all of a sudden there starts to be a zero sum game played internally so bad it manifests physically. It's like, all right, if you're not going to make the change, I'm going to make the change for you. Change or you die. That's what cancer is, essentially. If you want to understand mm -hmm. that, to be where I do have a video on cancer that's on, on my YouTube channel. And I would go watch that and, and look at the individuals within your line that had cancer and think about, well, what is it in their life that you almost can feel them internally screaming to change, but not changing? Okay. Or change, but not changing. And then you apply that then to your life. Is there anything where it's like, I need to make this change, but I'm not changing. Oh, I need to make this change, but I'm not changing. It's a severe parts war internally, like the worst there is within a person. Solve that war quickly. And by doing so, you will have broken that same pattern that was running through the family line of being prompted to change and not changing over and over again. Right. So that's how to fix that one on the father's side. On the mother's side, it's, it's about like, even in the way you're talking, it's like, oh, I, I, no matter what, even though I see that I'm behaving the same way as my mom, I can't change the way that I'm behaving. That's strange to feel that same sensation of powerlessness towards your own behavior. What you're not recognizing is, is, is it's a choice. Like there's an aspect of you, a part of you that is choosing, deliberately choosing to continue with those behaviors because it thinks it's benefiting it. So you have to look into why those aspects are continuing the behavior, even though they experienced pain with it before. Why are we maintaining this? And then altering the perspective of those aspects so they can exhibit a different pattern. The way that we know that an, an ancestral trauma is healed is that it's changed. So if you look at the word healing, right, to heal is to become the opposite or to become the improvement. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I'm looking from an objective viewpoint at a family line, I know that a pattern of emotional unavailability is healed when, oh, look. We've got emotional availability suddenly being displayed between parents and children. It's when the pattern change has occurred, when you recognize that. Where we get into issues here is when people are like, how do you know you're completely healed from ancestral trauma? You, you can't, and you're not, because that is the work of your life. People are still dealing with sort of ancestral healing and improving things throughout the course of their whole life. So when we think about ancestral trauma, it's not about a thing that we're meant to do and get done with. Just like healing in general or 
or life improvement in general, or self-improvement in general. This is a lifelong process that we're engaged in, many of which the patterns belong to ancestry. So ancestry, ancestral work is something you're doing for the totality of your life. It's never done. So it's ongoing. <laughs> yes. I see. Yeah, it's Thank ongoing. you so much. Which is why when I did when I did this course, like I what I wanted to do is give people the template. I'm like, this is the how to so that it doesn't matter whether you're applying it right now at age 20 to, you know, a pattern that you've got with, you know, let's say in relationships or when you're 80 and you're applying it to a pattern with what your purpose is. It's all the same. You're doing the same things regardless of at what phase in your life and relative to what pattern you're recognizing. Okay. I see. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. We should do more themed workshops. I'm, I'm having fun with this one. It feels like we can dive deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah. Okay, Maria, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Hi, Teal. Hello. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. <laughs> um, let me pull up my question so I can read it because I'm nervous. <laughs> Ah, okay. Wait, I can't find it now. I can read it for you, Maria, if you'd like. Um, wait, I, I think I can find it. I'm sorry. One second. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Hi, Teal. I was adopted and changed hands a few times. I was abandoned at the hospital twice, went to a foster family, was adopted by my legal mother, then my legal father, but then my legal mother's ex became more of a father figure to me. And I still consider that to be my <laughs> energetic father. And then I became close with um, three other families who I lived with a few of them for a while. So I guess overall, my question is, um, where does it, uh, hang on. <laughs> um, what is your perspective on whether my ancestral line would include all of these families' histories? Or, I'm so nervous right now, I'm sorry. Um, or if it would just be my blood and legal parentage. I feel a bit like a hot potato. <laughs> I can see the interest in having the heritage of all of these families and also how it might be too much for one person. So, thank you. Okay, when it comes to, to like really committing to ancestral healing, right? you're gonna be wanting to look at your birth parents. That, that goes for anybody who's adopted out. That's where the real juice is and where the most dominant patterns within your, your being basically are, right? So that will focus you a little bit when it comes to looking at social trauma and social healing for yourself. However, you are a very interesting case because I mean, let's sort of backtrack and look at your intention before coming into this life and opting into an experience like you just described. Each one of those influences, let's call them influences, right? The other influences in terms of parentage, right? They offered things, both positive and negative. So it's almost like, you know how you came in with these very solid sort of deck of cards. I talked about the deck of cards that comes in with your birth father and birth mother. There are also some other cards you wanted from all these different influences, like a little sprinkling of other cards. Some of them positive, some of them negative. Whether those cards that you interacted with here have something to do with their ancestry, you know, or not, they influenced you. And many of them did. Like many of those cards did, in, you know, relate to the, those people's ancestry. So you are interacting with ancestry no matter what pattern you're sort of looking at. So knowing that, where does your question then go to when I say all that? I guess when I thought of the question, I was listening to your interview when you were talking about doing this workshop. And so I was like, okay, so when I do my own healing work, should I be looking at all of their patterns as well? Or just- I want you to start with your birth family. Okay. The birth lines is where you need to start. Where it's gonna start to bleed over into other things is like, let's say that, let's say that you notice in your healing journey that you have the tendency to pop to anger quickly 
And you realize, wait a minute, this person, this man who I interacted with all the time as a child also pops to anger quickly. That may take you down a line of that relates to his ancestry, even though that's not a paternal birth parent, right? So you will be, by definition, working with ancestral trauma, even though it's not technically in your body, it's in you by virtue of influence. Does that make kind of sense? Like what I'm wanting you to do is to work first with what's in your body. So the epigenetic. Yes. Right first. Okay. From there you expand and it is still, it's like you, like I just said, it is still ancestral work you will be doing because many of the patterns that influenced you in these other sort of parentage dynamics did relate to their ancestry. So you are working with an external form of ancestry, but that's no different really. I mean, it is it's a little bit different because it impacted you more, but that's no different than, you know, I technically am doing ancestral work when I'm working with anyone's patterns. Like you watch me in a basic workshop and I'm like, all right, let's look at these issues that we have around, you know, the powerlessness around finances. I'm probably working with their great grandparent, right? Um, and definitely like you coming into to those lines, not only you being influenced by them, but you being sort of into this type of work, this would be something that the universe is real interested in is you engaging in sort of the ancestral healing for all of these parentage lines, regardless of whether or not they're technically in you. Yeah, I think that was kind of my question too. <laughs> oh yeah. But it, I don't, instead of, this is what I want to give you, instead of feeling really sort of weighed down by, oh my gosh, this is now crazy overwhelming like what I opted into, because instead of it being about, you know, two family lines, it's about like 18 family lines, um, that you wouldn't have only opted into this because of, of like, oh, we got to put all this trauma on her. It's because so much of even the issues that you've got running through your, your bloodlines that are in your body, a lot of the antidotes, in fact, were inherent in some of these other influences. I can see that. I can see how that's true. I don't actually know my lead, my um, blood parents at all. I don't have any information on them, but I know that they're, I'm Romanian. I don't know if they're Romanian or Hungarian though. So <laughs> I guess I could do research just generally on the history of those countries to start with. So, so this is when I'm working with anybody who's been part of an adoption dynamic, I am very very much about fueling them to find out however much they can. I mean, literally like become like a dog on a bone with like finding out as much as you possibly can. If you fully run into, I mean, it's really hard to run into full on dead ends if you're like dedicated enough, but um, if I you run, let's say you do, let's say you run into a full blown dead end on that, you know, you've got even sort of genetic research opens up doors for you know, potentially based off of knowing that my genetics come from this place, I can now study, you know, the stuff that comes from this place, reown some of these cultural, you know, benefits, disown some of these cultural attributes I see in myself that are not so positive. You can just be doing it in a more sort of detached way than knowing the personal stories. You can know the cultural stories. I think I work better with that kind of um, larger picture <laughs> anyway. So I think that would be fun. Actually, okay. I'm really excited about this. Thank you for doing this. Well, I'm excited too. I can't wait to see what's about to happen with you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Okay. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I did not expect this to happen actually. Uh, okay. So, uh, well, um, I actually had uh, added in two questions, but my first one was related to uh, um, why. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, at you at some point you mentioned uh, that you even mentioned this a bit in the beginning that you know past lives are not so important and we should just focus on what's happening here and uh, deal with that what comes up you know uh, in the moment and I was wondering uh, what is 
the difference uh, or what changed or what is the difference between this term? So maybe past lives is different than ancestral healing in some way. And I, I was curious to kind of dive deeper a bit into, into that topic. Okay, when people are talking about past lives, they're they're essentially talking about a stream of consciousness, or most people look at it like a clump of, of energy, which is not accurate, coming into an incarnation and then pulling completely out of an incarnation. And that experience being what dictates the next incarnation that a person or, sorry, unit of consciousness decides to engage in. There doesn't have to be any kind of a train there, honestly. Um, what I mean by that is, is like you could choose to essentially become a goat and then you gain all that awareness. So you possess that awareness and then, you know, with that awareness, you can then go become a grass blade, you know? So it's consciousness incarnating into a form is when we're talking about reincarnation and the, the picture of um, past lives, right? Mm -hmm. With ancestral trauma, what we're talking about is opting into a family line. And by doing so, you're literally choosing to put on a consciousness with an entire storyline. So, so to use our previous example, there's a difference between, you know, a, a non-physical consciousness choosing to become a goat and then coming out and choosing to become a grass blade. Then there is coming in and choosing to be a goat. And by virtue of doing so, inheriting on, on a non-physical and physical level, all these attributes and patterns and traits that pertain to 5,000 goats that came before that one. You're literally jumping into and inheriting a storyline. And it has so, it, so much impact on, on what it is that you're doing in the here and now. Okay. We don't tend to, so when we jump from life to life, we don't actually tend to bring as much with us as people love to think that we do. Because, because we relate to ourselves in this identity, right? Like I relate to myself as Teal Swan, but when I'm pulling myself out of Teal Swan, I don't stay Teal Swan. So it's not like, oh, it's not like I'm inserting Teal Swan into this incarnation and then into that incarnation and then into that incarnation. It's a complete withdrawal of one perspective into a completely different perspective. Does that kind of make sense? That's me sort of yeah. defining the difference between ancestral whatever it is, ancestral inheritance and past life stuff. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Okay, and can I just uh, add a, a one more kind of question? Yeah. It's a small one. Uh, so I kind of um, found out from various, um, I don't know, ways that uh, my grandpa could be one of my spirit guides. Is mm -hmm. that possible? Yes, and it's quite common. It is actually quite common that ancestors, essentially their thought forms, I should say, stick around as guides to their progeny. And it's also not unheard of for them to incarnate back into the family. Mm, okay. And does, does that mean, because, well, in my relationship to him was very close up to a point, and then we kind of drifted apart. And even like when he died, I was very numb. I couldn't like feel anything. Thing. I mean, I cried at the funeral because everyone cried and I'm an emotional person, but like I couldn't like really connect to to him. And I'm I'm well, I guess I'm having a hard time to reconnect, especially that, you know, he's not here anymore. And I, I'm just realizing how connected we I think we were. Uh, and I kind of because he I feel like he abandoned me or something. I pushed it away very, very hard. I don't know. Is how is that possible? And can you give me some starting tips? <laughs> you want meaning you wanting to reconnect with them? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's more easily done on an esoteric level. So with journey work or with, you know, you can do journey work with breath work. You can do journey work with shamanic medicines. You can do meditative work. Because obviously when somebody is, is passed on like that and is no longer interacting with you in a physical way, you really want to be looking at non-physical options for connection. So if I was in your position, I really wanted to reestablish that, that's what I would do. But another way, sort of a more tangible way, if you don't want to go down that esoteric route of reconnecting with him is to like, look at his life and look at what he was wanting and find some kind of a way to connect with him in the physical. So like, let's say he was into a hobby, getting into that hobby brings that connection back. If he had an aptitude, embodying that aptitude is a way of bringing that connection back. Um, 
honoring this person in a way is a way of bringing it back. I mean, it's ironic. I said, I'm saying this because like, look, if you look behind me, I've got sort of my, what do you call this? It's like a, a wall of ancestry, right? Um, almost like honoring them in some way like that with items that they liked or, I mean, the Eastern cultures do this the best. Items they liked, maybe offerings, maybe talking to them, you know, having images of them around the house, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. these are my guys by the way <laughs> I thought it only fitting for them to have this conversation with us today <laughs> indeed yeah thank you Teal thank you so much for all the work that you do and yeah I'm so happy that you are in this world with us <laughs> thank you so much thank you all right last question I will <laughs> Okay. I will read aloud to you. Okay. The question is, when ancestral bloodlines are healed, what effect does it have on the soul groups, which are directly connected to the bloodlines through embodiment, currently alive on earth in the now? No pressure, guys. It's just everything. Okay. Okay, so what impact does ancestral healing have on the progeny, right? Is that essentially what we're asking? Or... Yeah, the progeny, but also the soul groups that are directly connected to the bloodlines. Yeah. Okay. This is a very comprehensive picture. I could write a Bible on this one. So let's try to condense this as fast as we can. If you look at, at a person, right, just an individual, and you think about them coming into a space of healing, that means the detrimental patterns are changed to beneficial patterns. That means the positive attributes are completely owned and embodied. That means, you know, whatever else that means. If you look at a person doing that, you could ask yourself, what is the ultimate outcome of that? The ultimate outcome of that is actualization. The ultimate outcome of that is that you have the fulfilled potential of that particular individual. This is what most of us are going for on an individual level when we are committed to personal growth or when we're committed to awakening and enlightenment, things like that. We're, we're ultimately wanting to reach our full potential and reach a state of, of actualization and reach a state of conscious choice. All we need to do to understand what happens when we do this type of healing on a collective level is just suddenly make that person into a group. So suddenly the family line itself is actualized. Suddenly the family line itself or the family group itself has reached its state of full potential and is operating in that state of full potential. Now, if you think of the implications, the ripple effects of, of a family line being in that state of highest potential, I mean, I could sit here for a year probably talking to you about that and like sitting here and thinking about all the different ways that that could apply. Think about what would change the ripple effect of fully actualized group consciousness in terms of the environment that they're in. The types of beings who would opt into that type of line, obviously it doesn't work outside the picture of expansion. So they would have to already come in as that. And so step into a state of improvement from there even more further maximizing, you know, the, the full potential and uh, full expression, I should say, of that particular line. Everything this, this entity, which is a group consciousness, comes into contact with is impacted by that state that they're in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it just, it's like I could, I can't, there's no way for me to sit here and be like, oh, it just does A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It does thousands upon millions upon billions of things in terms of everything that it interacts with and everything that is a part of itself. All to the positive, essentially. Is that a good enough answer to that question, do you think? Can I read it, read it to me one more time so I can see if it's like, if that's exactly what they're wanting to know. Okay. When ancestral bloodlines are healed, what effect does it have on the soul groups which are currently directly connected to the bloodlines through embodiment currently alive on earth? And oh, okay, okay. Well, there's no, there's no, wait a minute. So the, 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 I guess I should say that what I just told you, that sort of state of ultimate embodiment is not, is not accommodative of that type of ideal because the people themselves who are in, it's almost like to suggest your question suggests that it's possible for a, a sort of like a family consciousness to achieve that state of potential, but to have people living on earth that are part of that, that are not, that's not the case. 
it's literally the people who are incarnated that are that are dragging the family line into that um, state of actualization. But I think more where you're headed with this question, as opposed to the way it was worded, is that when, let's say you yourself or multiple people in the family are doing tons and tons and tons of healing. So as to get that consciousness, that group consciousness to a higher and higher and higher state. What that does, if it's vibrating at a higher level, because it's feeding into, like imagine this is energy streams, it's feeding into these people that are embodied in the here and now, is it's essentially offering the antidote to them, which is part of why it is so important for people, even when they don't have children, to be working on their family lines like this. Because even if you don't have direct children, you're working on the family line. Let's say you create some pattern change within that family line, or you create an elevation in the consciousness itself of that family line. That is still feeding down into nephews, nieces, you know, grandchildren, whatever else it is. They are being impacted and influenced by that and are thus more likely to change into alignment with it themselves. They may have been, like, let's say that they may have been raised in a certain way. Let's say that the family pattern is emotional unavailability. Let's just use that. And they were raised by their parents who were also emotionally unavailable. So right now they're currently in that pattern of unavailable emotionally. And they've adapted to it. And the ways that they've adapted to it have made it so that they are not very emotionally available, even though they're four, five, six, seven, right? Let's say that grandma goes, whoa, I've been on this crazy journey and I realize I'm 60 right now, but I just realized that I have an issue with this emotional availability. My parents had an issue with this. Unfortunately, I raised my kids this way. Oh no, you know? But they, but that person, she decides to change that, that, that behavior. So she changes the pattern herself of emotional availability. She does the work around maybe sort of forgiveness of the parents, maybe even esoteric practices around watching her parents get that emotional availability need met when they didn't before. So there's all this healing taking place that's changing the vibratory frequency of this group consciousness up here. That's influencing the child. So even though the child themselves is still, because they, like I said, they've adapted to it already, they're still already in this, this pattern of emotional unavailability. Even if this, this grandmother had no interaction with those grandchildren, just by virtue of changing that vibration, there's more pressure, we could call this positive pressure, against the behaviors that the grandchildren are currently engaged in that were a byproduct of this, this um, way of being, you know, the byproduct of this emotional unavailability. Thus making them 10 times, 11 times, 12 times more likely in their lifetime to shift in back into alignment with that new frequency of the consciousness line. So you're actually, you're putting positive pressure on anybody who is incarnated in that family line. Now this only gets further enhanced if grandma also goes, you know what, I do have contact with my grandchildren. I realize that all the forces in this family are emotionally unavailable. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to be emotionally available for my grandchildren. Now, all she's doing is tangibly um, changing that pattern in a direct way and intangibly changing that pattern in this more indirect way. Cool, right? I think that's more what you were asking. Okay, so you heard it from you guys. It matters that you're doing this work because so much of ancestral trauma is about what you're experiencing right now. Also, it doesn't matter if you never plan to have kids. If you don't have them, any work you do on your family line impacts any progeny that is born to that family line. And that's an extension of you, regardless of whether it came through your body or not. So if I were you, I'd want to definitely give that progeny the best start because if you saw how much your family line came through and went through in order to get you here, you would be much more invested in the story of how that line continues. And you could consider yourself a, a really powerful, beneficial element of the story of that family line. Maybe you're the game changer. I mean, I don't really think you'd be sitting here listening to me right now if you weren't the game changer in your family. <laughs> but yeah, it is my hope um, that those of you who can will engage in this e-course because the e-course that I put together makes all of this make so much more sense, like so much more sense. And I have broken it down, like I said, in a way that makes everything so incredibly practical and so incredibly tangible. And I want to thank you for joining me on this workshop because I absolutely love this subject. You have you've traipsed into one of my little passions, which is being a shadow worker, history and 
genealogy. And if you want to see that course or you want to buy that course, it's actually available now. Ah, yay, it is available. My e-course on ancestral healing is available. Um, to find that, you go to my, my website. You're going to go to tealswan.com. But I'm about to have Tristan, one of my team members, come on here, and she will tell you exactly how to find it so that it's really easy for you. You ready? Yes. Okay, thanks for joining me. Here's Tristan. Hello, everyone. So I can one vouch um, personally that this course is incredible. I've taken it myself and it's changed everything about the way that I live my life and even in my own relationship to myself. So I highly suggest it. Um, but you can find this course on her website. We have a large banner at the very top um, where you just click the Ancestral Healing course and it'll guide you to exactly where you need to get it. I will also be posting a link in the chat below so you can have access to it. Um, but other than that, I will also post the Facebook group in the chat so you can continue this conversation about ancestral healing. And for those of you that go through the course, you can kind of collaborate together to see what you find out about your ancestries, because there's so many juicy stories that you discover when you start to open up this treasure chest. Um, my last note is that Teal will actually be in person uh, for many events this upcoming summer. So we have events in New York, Austin, Texas, LA, and we have a CP training in Utah coming up soon. But other than that, thank you so much, you guys, for joining this Ancestral Healing Online Workshop. We've loved having you. I'll keep this chat open so you can keep talking to each other uh, for a little bit, but it was wonderful to have you all on.